<clears throat> so everybody will have to bear with me a little bit for the presentation because as you can see the screens are uh, cooperating very nicely. Um, the title of the presentation is more than just a serialization framework. Uh, Avro is looked at as a serialization system. Uh, reason being is that a serialization framework you can go with something like protobuf which will which will basically serialize and deserialize your data. Avro is intended to be much more than that, such as RPC. So I'm going to cover some things. History of serialization frameworks in general, just a topical overview so you can see kind of what's out there, where it has evolved from, uh, part of the rationale behind the decisions made in the implementation of Avro um, are very much driven from the history of other serialization frameworks. Uh, languages that are supported across Avro and other platforms, very important when you want to start taking your data between languages. Um, performance, there's a couple charts that are going to be very difficult to see. The presentation will be available for everybody afterward on the, uh, on the Chug site. Um, everything that is referenced in here, there are links for. Uh, the images are referenced in here, so anything that you like in here you'll be able to get very easily once it's posted on the site. Um, I'm going to go through some code examples. Uh, I'm going to show you, if you use Maven, how easy it is to actually plug Avro in and start using it. Show you some RPC examples. And I say some, really short. Uh, Avro is far simpler than most people expect. That includes for handling serialization as well as the RPC side. Um, I'm going to point out some resources we have and then we'll wrap it up. Um, anyways, so you can see a list of serialization frameworks that are out there. There's a lot. Most people are most familiar with JAXB, Protobuf, and Thrift. They're three of the biggest that are out there, the most heavily used. Some people forget that JAXB is a serialization framework. It's not great, depending on what you want to do. It's fantastic, but in general, it gets the job done. Now, Avro was created by the person who created Hadoop. He created it for a reason. The serialization frameworks that are out there, although they're fine, they have a lot of limitations. So he took the goals of Hadoop and kept them at the forefront while he was designing and implementing it. <clears throat> so a very important thing to keep in mind, and for those of you who saw a presentation last year on Avro by Chris Cooper, um, very little repeat information in here, and I have a reference at the end if you haven't seen it. It has a lot of good previous information. But very important to do, the schema of the data is always available. Okay? Any serialization framework that's out there, other than this, aside from XML, self-describing, pretty much the schema's gone. You have it nowhere. If you want to work with the data, you need the proto definition, the thrift definition, whatever language it was serialized in, you need that definition file. Avro has the schema stored with your data file. So in the Hadoop world, if you have a billion rows of data written in your file, the very top of that file is the schema. It's there. Anytime that file gets loaded, it's able to be read by anybody deserializing it. <coughs> so a lot of people always like to ask the question, what are the limitations? What are the pros? What are the cons? Okay. It's pretty tough to come up with a good set of cons for Avro. If you want to start comparing it feature for feature against other frameworks, you can try and do that. Avro stacks up pretty tall against most of them. The big thing, and it usually isn't a sticking point, is that map keys can only be strings. You can't put an integer as the key. It won't work. Avro will bark, tell you to go home. It's just, it, it will not work with a period. So that being the predominant limitation in Avro, there are, there's really nothing else I've come across in Avro that you can't do. Emails can do. Can you speak up? Emails. What? Emails. I can't hear you. Enumerations. Enums? Enums are fully supported. Yeah, but uh, they are strings. 
They are what? They are screens. Try to do enums for integers. It doesn't work. Enums are enums. Um, interoperability. So one of the nice things is that Avro <coughs> manages its schema in JSON format. So it uses JSON schema to define the schema, which makes it very easily interoperable with almost anything you've got out there. Since the schema is in JSON format, you can take it web technologies, wherever you want to do, wherever your data is going, pretty much everything supports JSON, reading and writing. So it uses that for the schema. Now, when you want to start dealing with Avro data, you have to ask the question, do I want to write it out in plain text or do I want to write it out in binary? Now clearly in binary format, it's where you're going to pick up all the real benefit of it. But there are cases where you're going to want to be able to dump it out in clear text. It's as easy as can be with Avro. There are a handful of languages, and I'll show a few of them in a slide or two. Um, the data structures, everything is JSON. Anything that you can define in JSON, nested objects, it supports. It's all there. The RPC framework is as simple as it gets when it comes to building RPC. Um, the definition for how the servers talk to each other is handled with Avro schema and Avro protocols, which are defined, the, the protocol is a slightly different uh, format than the JSON schema, but it combines the information from the schema with your protocol that you define to be able to generate the stubs for the Java code and or the other languages that support it. Um, the simple integration with dynamic languages. Um, there's not really a lot for me to say with this except the fact that since the schema is there, you can dynamically work with it, which means you can inspect it at any time. Pretty much nothing else no other frameworks out there really give you that ability aside from like Jack Speed. Um, back in framework line with where I said before that Doug Cutting kept in mind to do is that they have put um, Snappy Kodak, which Google released open source, they built it right in. All you have to do is specify and say use compression, specify the codec to Snappy, and you have compressed data. It's block level, it's splittable, which means when you're doing MapReduce, your data is already able to be split. Now, Twitter had done something similar with Thrift. They used LZO, if anybody keeps up with what Twitter has done. <coughs> Using LZO compression, they had to compile their own, they had to build their own wrappers for it. They then used their Thrift uh, data format. They compressed it with LZO, they created split definition files that told where the boundaries were for it to be able to split and then happy day. It's already taken care of. The file doesn't need anything extra. When Avro loads the file, it says, oh, I can have this many jobs actually run on the file because it's built in splitability. Snappy has a trade-off of speed and performance. They would rather have a slightly bigger file to have better performance. So the languages. Um, there's a couple notes at the bottom, very important. RPC across these languages is referring to the HTTP implementation of the RPC interface that they have built across these languages. Uh, within Java, there's a dang implementation of RPC, works great. Uh, most people that do RPC in Java use dang. Um, the codecs that are supported, very clearly labeled. Uh, Snappy being one of the most impressive. When you start working in a lot of environments that want to do integration testing with other languages, Python being relatively popular, Snappy has a nice benefit here. Um, otherwise, it's as easy as flipping a flag for compression on or off. Um, there are no other languages documented that uh, support Avro at this point, but it's pretty decent support overall across languages. So, Avro wants to be the best serialization framework there is. When you say, what does it mean to be the best? Is it the fastest? Is it the smallest? Depending on what you're doing would depend on what is an important feature. So, 
Avro is not the fastest. There are some really slow ones. One of the fastest out there is, I believe, uh, Cryo, which you might be able to see a very small print on the next page. Um, but as far as where Avro is slower at, it's object creation. So the note that I have here, UTF-8, it does extra work to ensure that everything is handled properly. Might be important, might not. When the tests were done, UTF-8 was used, that's the nature of the beast for how it was done. So when you get down to it, you have to start laying down you know, what you need out of it. Now, as far as size, Avro, if you notice I put on here, in the tests that have been done, Avro is only tested by cryo by about one byte. It, 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 it's, it's effectively nothing for it. So the URL that I have down at the bottom there has been updated recently, and this chart is accurate for that. So Avro on the left side is the size of compression, and it's basically number two on the list. On the, on the total time, you can see it's clearly in the upper half. And anybody, yeah, Java, manual, then protobuf. So protobuf, very fast. Most people out there agree with this. I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that protobuf wasn't fast. But then you have a set of trade-offs that you have to look at. Simplicity, design, what it takes to actually define your schemas. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to uh, jump in like Boris did. So, Avro has a few different concepts in place. Uh, generic, specific, reflect. Generic. You have data. It has a schema written at the top of it. You can interact with it. You don't need to know anything else other than at, ins at inspection time, the data's there. Um, PIG, if anybody here has ever used PIG, uh, the PIG tool bank, or PIG, the piggy bank that was created for PIG, uh, there's an implementation in there that actually supports using the generic type. You basically tell it the name of the field you want, and at load time, it reads the schema, it parses everything out, and says, okay, I'm giving you this column. Don't care what it is, you've told me the name, I'll go get it, you're done. It's the flexibility of the language. Specific, you start getting into um, when you want to use RPC. So the big benefit here is that when you use RPC, you need to know concretely what's getting passed across the RPC handle. There is no room for negotiation. It is what it's supposed to be or it is not, which means your handshake will pass or it will not. So with that, you actually start with a definition file, so a JSON schema file, and then you generate your objects out of that. So each of those languages on the previous slide that you saw, you can generate your stub objects in each of those languages that'll then be specific to that language you can work with. Reflect is specifically to say, at runtime, take this object you've given Avro, <coughs> just make it work. So in Java world, you take any POJO, you hand it to Avro and say serialize it to file. When you're writing it to file, it will store the schema at the top, as long as you have that same POJO when you want to deserialize it, you're good and happy. It will work perfectly fine. A lot of times, probably, I don't know, maybe 50% of the time, that's what most people want to do. They want to take what they've got, they want to serialize it quickly, easily, no effort. Keep in mind, like I said before, no keys other than strings and maps. Yeah. <laughs> but, the question, we've been arguing this for a while. Who's we? You and me. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't realize we were arguing. <laughs> uh, so you would say both JSON's schema is, as you said, I don't think if you have more or less complex uh, schema to deal with. That's why uh, you should probably mention there was an article in, in the video that was done by one of the guys. Uh, is his with, name Boris? Uh, his name is actually Ben. Uh, he extended uh, XGC compiler to generate uh, upper classes directly from XSD. So you can have your cake and do it at the same time. You can extend the tools for defining your schemas and you can generate your upper schemas and other functional files. That's really well. So 
so to summarize, you're saying that someone created a tool to take an XSD and generate Avro definition files. Yeah. Great. Is it open source? <laughs> what? Uh, I couldn't you hear used you. to be open source. You should know better than asking this question. Was it posted as part of the info queue? <laughs> uh, no, but uh, we're trying to open source it. All right. Um, so this is the complexity when wanting to create and work with Avro. <coughs> this is what it takes to be able to write data. That's it. You don't need anything else. This will take an object that you give it, it will collect on the object, it'll inspect it, it will determine what the schema is. It's like I mentioned before, it supports nested objects, no problem. Three lines of code, you're good. You don't have to do anything else to get started with Avro. This is one of those things that when I first started learning what Avro was, how to use it, what the goods, the bads were, I walked right by this multiple times because it's too simple. It's documented on their website. Not in this exact form, but really, really simple. This creates a reflect data writer and writes. Call it as much as you want to write whatever you need to. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that in just a couple minutes. Okay. Yep. So the specific type. Well, if you have generated your Java objects from the schema definition, and you have that object, you create a specific data writer. There is speed implications depending on the type of writer you use because each one has to do a different amount of, different amount of work in order to actually do its job. So when you use specific, you end up getting the absolute best results because everything is predetermined. There's no guesswork, there's no reflection that has to be done. So when you start with your schema file and you generate your stubs, it's done all the work ahead of time. But you'll notice it's basically the same three lines of code with instead of reflect data writer, specific data writer, there's really nothing else to it. It's going to be a really stupid question, but when I see the word file in the name of the class, it makes me think that it's specific to writing a file. This is specific to writing a file because it's a file writer. So where, where's the file actually? Data writer, is that something that takes in the file? Uh, that, that sounds weird. I don't see a file with the, uh, the, the API right there. And the fact that it's tied to the file scares me as opposed to like it's an output string. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. It's uh, just one step after the other for this. So, really, that's the last thing you've got is where you want to write to. <coughs> It's called a file writer because it writes records. You give it an object, it writes a record. What the output stream is irrelevant. It doesn't make any difference. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a file, it's just a stream. Yeah, effectively, yeah. Uh, what really matters, though, is that you've got the concept of autonomous records being written. And so if you want your output stream to be something else active, you have to ensure <coughs> that whatever that is, it's expecting the same data format. So, if you need to append to a file you already have, there's an append to on here. Um, otherwise, you literally just call append with your object over and over and you're done. There's nothing else. A lot of people think that, you know, okay, that's easy to set up, but it's got to be just a nightmare to deserialize. Um, yeah, it's really not. It's, again, it's just, it's almost stupid simple. Um, I, I can't give enough kudos to Doug Cunning because he really thought it through when he designed this. Uh, I think he's someone who probably felt the pain that a lot of people did working with a lot of serialization frameworks and said, okay, uh, protobuf was created by this guy at Google, and then that guy quit, and he went to Facebook, and he rewrote protobuf as thrift. Same guy wrote both. He improved upon a couple little problem areas with thrift, and he added RPC. Doug Cutting said, it's great. You know, we need something, but we need better. Here are the problems. We need to solve them. So he did. Schema evolution is one of them, as Norm asked just a minute ago, and we'll cover it in a couple minutes. So you end up, for reading, you specify the schema you want to read. You create a reader, and that's it. I mentioned compression before. When it writes the schema out, when it starts writing, you have to specify before you write the first record whether or not it's going to be compressed or not. It writes it as a part of the schema. It's there for free. 
it's there. You create a reader, it already knows whether it's compressed or not. You don't have to tell it, oh, this was compressed, this wasn't compressed. You don't have anything extra to keep track of. There's no extra bells and whistles here. It just works. So, specific schema. This is JSON format. It really is nothing special. Um, the documentation on the website is very good. Uh, when you first start getting into it, it can be a little bit tricky because some of the nomenclature that's used is not really very <coughs> obvious. Uh, but I think I've got enough of the basics in here that if you want to get started with Avro, you can take these and they should be a really good helper for you to say, oh, this makes sense now. Um, you create your objects, it generates from that your files, your POJOs in Java, your other definition files in other languages. You can define exceptions. So when you have RPC service calls, you can have it throw a certain type of exception. It's something that usually is not very easy to do in RPC frameworks to extend it to actually make it do what you want it to do in a simple way. So you can call this remote procedure call, and if it has a certain problem, you can throw this exception back across the RPC. It's just another Avro serialized object. So the fields get defined. They're effectively arbitrary. Um, the symbols for anything you know, just strings. Forrest left, so he doesn't want to argue with me on that. Um, so fields can be null or not. You can predefine whether or not you want them to be nullable. There's a different rule set that gets used for whether um, when it generates a Java object, if it uses a uh, primitive or if it uses a wrapper class, depending on whether it's nullable or not. So clearly, if you have an object that has a whole bunch of primitive fields, you don't want them to be nullable. So that it actually will save a little bit more data in your object. Um, Aliases, as you see, I've got that bolded up here. This is what actually supports schema evolution. So the nice thing about this, and I have went through this, I've practiced it. It's one of those things that if you don't know it's there, you don't know how to use it, you have to create something, serialize it, go change your code, break it in a certain specific way to say, how do I fix it now? The aliases. So aliases work for reading and writing. If you wrote with this schema, you can read from that schema. The reader says, I can see your schema's documented here. I found this object to deserialize into. You also have aliases. So if there's an alias there, it doesn't find the original object. This says, well, I'll look up the alias. Oh, I have the alias. I'll deserialize into it. Now, you have to keep in mind that this is JSON. So if at some point in the future you just said, you know what? I don't care about this data anymore. I'm not going to even take the time to deserialize it into my object and just let it get thrown away. You can do that because you have an alias. So you could create one object type, have different, different people could technically have different aliases, and deserialize it in slightly different ways. The schema evolution supports it, it's there, it's as powerful or as weak as you want it to be. But the thing is, none of the other frameworks support it, they, they don't have it. Uh, excuse me, so alias, but what about, it, it, it's many versions, like, I mean, alias of alias of alias You can have many aliases. So, Whatever is available at runtime when it's reading, and it needs to deserialize it, it will find the class that's available. You create an alias when you no longer have the class available to you. If you still had it available to you, you wouldn't need an alias. What's the actual framework used? Because that means it's done. If you had a deprecated number variable. Deprecated makes no difference. If it's there, it's there. No, I mean, by not deprecated in the Java sense, but it's truly really gone. So if it's in the data, Correct. and when it goes to read it, you have an alias here, and it says, okay, I'm going to deserialize this data into this class. It's going to take each field and find a matching thing to deserialize it to. Okay. If your object doesn't have it there, it doesn't get linked. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the construct works in all the languages. Anybody have any questions about this? I have a question. Yeah. So uh, you said that you actually write this Itself, yes. And you can also override the schema. Right. So when you create your reader, you're actually handing it a schema definition. You have an object that has a schema definition in it. 
And so your new object would say, I have an alias of this old one. Right? Your new one is named accordingly. This is the new historical message. The alias is, it also can read the historical message. Right? Because when you wrote it originally, you wrote it with the name historical message. Now you've got your new one. The reader says, I am this, but if you come across anything called historical message, I'll take care of that too. So it generally takes care of the data type as well as the name of the qualifier itself? Yes. So in the JSON definition, int, integer, well, it's, it's, it's defined as int, long, double, float, all of the primitive data types available are there. So if you change data types, I really haven't tried, uh, but I have to imagine that uh, type coercion with primitives is rather easy in the framework. Uh, I highly doubt that it would choke on it as you change versions. Uh, but one of the bigger things that a lot of people like to ask about is arrays, lists. Well, in JSON, it's handled as a list, effectively. So you can create lists. So it doesn't matter what the actual data structure is that you have, it will get coerced into that JSON type. JSON is just for the schema. JSON is not for the serialization itself. Uh, that's right. It's just for the schema, but it has the support, like I mentioned before, where it can do Avro binary or Avro JSON. So it uses the Jackson parser behind it. So if you want to serialize it straight text, you'll get exactly what you're expecting, which is standard <coughs> JSON notation. So in the event that you're doing this text as opposed to binary. Yes. Yep. So the Maven section is really very boring. But it's important. Uh, it was important enough that uh, Maven is very strong. Maven simplifies a lot of things. These plugins right here, don't worry about memorizing them. Like I said, they're going to be available on the Chug site. It's going to be out there. If you, kind of, if you get to the point where you say, I'm ready to use Avro, and now you use Maven, I want to plug it in. Go reference this. It's going to save you at least a couple hours of pain and suffering looking to see what plugins you need. It, yeah, there, there's really not much else to say. The notes are here. It's there. You, again, the code that I showed you, simple Java code. Three lines here, three lines there. <laughs> That's all it takes when you plug it into Maven. You don't have to go find the libraries anywhere. It'll just know what to do at the right stages of the Maven build. So RPC is where I think the fun actually begins with, with <coughs> Avro. So as a serialization framework in general, it's very strong. Very simple. It's easy to use. So, these are the steps for creating an RPC server. Now, important details of the RPC server. You start a server up, you give it an INET address in Java, you give it the port as part of the INET address. You tell it the specific implementation type that you want to use for the server. There is a Netty server, there is an HTTP server. There's one or two others that are out there that are not officially production worthy, but they're there. Um, <clears throat> you cannot use RBC without starting with the JSON schema files. You can't take a file generated from a reflect data writer and hope to be able to pass it across your RPC channel. Not possible. Not supported. You're not going to do it. You have to start with the schema, you have to generate the objects because it actually builds the protocol into the stub objects it generates and it builds everything necessary there. It's simple, you just have to know that you have to start with the specific format. Took me a while to figure it out. Another one of those things that's overly simplified in the documentation they have, it doesn't really come out and say, you must do exactly this to do this. But it is that simple. It seems like it would defeat the purpose of having a, a nice, terse data format to pass it back and forth. But is it just for warming? Like, is it only you have to do it once, once you, once perfection? Once you uh, the, the RPC server handshakes with the client. So the client will connect to it, they'll handshake on the protocol. And that's why they have to start with their specific data type. Yeah. Because when you create your client, you need <coughs> the implementation interface so that it can basically reflect on that and automatically create your client for you. I guess what I mean is if you're passing the scheme over the wire, that's a lot bigger than the actual object serialization. If you're doing that for one object, 
No, no, it's just one time. It's just handshake. Okay. Yeah, just, just handshake. Time. So like when the, the client connects again, it says, oh, I know this one, I don't need to receive. Right, when the client connects to the server, the very first thing it does when it sends to connect is it sends its protocol and says, this is who I am. And the server accepts it or denies it. obvious when you look through the documentation the first time. So I pulled out what I thought is the most important details. Um, you'll see there's a void, something happened. Uh, there's a one-way marker at the end of that. Saying basically, <coughs> the client will call it, and it will expect no response. So it won't wait for anything. The command will execute. It'll keep going. Next line. So when you've got a client that basically just wants to send and forget, one way is what you want to do. You expect nothing to get returned, just be happy. You don't need anything else to go on. Um, sports comments, yay. Uh, useful at times. Um, the example of doing the throws. You'll notice that everything in here is fully qualified. Com dot or company dot error dot wrong server state exception. Everything needs to be unambiguous. It wants to know exactly. Whatever the name is that you gave it, the namespace that you put it in, you need to be very specific here. It might seem like overkill, but when you start getting into complex RPC services, you start getting into this service talking to that service, you have a client to this one becomes a server of that one, it greatly simplifies and keeps it neat, tidy, clean. When you define those schemas, though, you can import them. You can put more than one schema in a file if you want to. It really makes no difference. It's just a preference thing. This right here will yield a Java interface and an implementation. So I mentioned what you have to specify to create the actual RPC server. One, two, three lines of code, and one to start. Four lines, that's it. It took me solid four hours to find this in the documentation after I passed it over the first time, thinking there's more I need. There's not. So when I sound like, you know, just land basic duck cutting and you know gracious comments, it just seems right. It's it's just simple. Why make it complex? It takes the class that is generated by Avro as the actual implementation. That's the, uh, the history tracker class is what gets generated as the actual interface. It says, okay, this is who I am. It has the protocol in there. It knows exactly what it's going to expect. You hand it your concrete implementation. It says, I'm going to create the, uh, the server. This is what is going to actually do the communication. The netting server gets that responder with the address accordingly, you're done. Start, you're set. Go create a client. On the client side, you need that history tracker class that was generated. Avro generated it for you for a reason up front. That is your contract. That's the piece that I keep saying, you know, keep in mind, you have to do it ahead of time. That's the part of the specific implementation that it needs. The transceiver is basically what's actually going to do the real work. There are multiple implementations of the transceiver as well as the uh, server on the other side, NetE, HTTP, a couple others that I mentioned. Any questions? <coughs> no questions on RPC? Nothing? Are you going on other stuff? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much just uh, some Resource references. What's the interface on the client side? On the, like the, the Netty receiver that you get? What's the, do you have any uh, reference implementation? This generates the actual interface definition, and your client and server can share that same file. I'm just curious, is it, you know, if there's not a receive method that you get handled to your object or something like that? 
uh, a receive object that you get a handle. No, it's so when you create. So when you create the client here, object, RPC interface client, and get the actual client, that's the one you're going to call. That will do the remote, remote call. Anything in that interface that you define saying it's going to return an object of this type, it's going to return a primitive, whatever it is, it's all going to be handled for you. It's going to be just like it's running local right there on the machine. As far as implementation details go, you now have a client that's going to talk remotely. There is no more complication to it. It's based specifically off that interface that you've got defined, that is your RPC interface. So all the methods you defined in your protocol are right there available to you. So if you said add numbers, or get money, or send me this, send me that, send him, whatever. Anything that you put in there, that method is going to be mirrored on one side and the other. The receiver takes care of the call coming from the client automatically. You have your implementation behind that interface that says fill in the work. Right? It's an interface. Create your concrete implementation. Whatever you want it to do when that method gets called. You want it to log to a file, log to a file. You want it to blow up and set an exception, go ahead. So you take that interface that gets generated from that protocol, and that is the one thing you need on your client and your server. On your client, you use it to make the calls. You don't have anything else you need to do, right? You have the client that says, I'm going to call this service that exists. Here are its methods. Execute. On the server, you say, well, I am the server, so I need to be able to support when someone calls me. Fill in your implementation details. Same for Thrift. 
It was a pretty big overhaul to the system. It's all in there now. It works great. A lot of people like it. So if there's something that was holding you back from possibly trying it, it's out there. It's available. It's those same exact screens that I showed you how to create the readers and writers. It's the same code. So a couple of resources. Um, the benchmarking that I had the images from. Um, <laughs> Avro documentation, like I said, I stand behind my statement. The documentation that's on the wiki, that's on the main Apache site, that shows you how to create the schemas, uh, the reference information for that, the protocols, etc., is really good. The Java docs are horrible. If you want to figure out how to turn um, how to turn compression on, you're not going to find it in the Java docs very easily. Uh, the previous Avro chuck that we did last year. <coughs> or, or was it, something like that. Um, it's available at that link. It's also in the, uh, the files section. <coughs> of the Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, who was that Chris Cruz guy? I, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I hardly recall remembering him. I haven't seen him in a while. I know. He, he skips out a lot. <laughs> well, did you also talk about uh, Odiago uh, Wikidata, another user of uh, Avro on uh, Apple uh, No. Uh, okay. I don't really have anything to talk about with them. All right. Um, like I said, this will go up within the next day or so, up on the chub. Yep. Oh, Boris, you have another question? Uh, so have you seen uh, JavaScript? Have you seen JavaScript? Yeah, for Opera. JavaScript what? JavaScript support for Avro. JavaScript support for Avro. Well, if you were to reading and writing from uh, Avro uh, JSON, that would just work. Yeah, no, I <laughs> Thank you very much. But no, I haven't seen anything for the binary support for that. But PHP has support. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody might. <laughs> Anybody else have any other questions? Anything at all? Anything you wish you could possibly do with the serialization framework that I might not have covered that you don't know if this maybe can do it? Norm? <laughs> I don't know why I would ask this. If you were reading and writing Avro to say age base, would that would uh, does the definition get included with the column family, or does it get included with every record? Uh, so you would end up handling it aside from the actual schema. You would want to manage it separately. So there's a way to do that to separate out the data. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's a built-in way to do it. But it can be done. What you have to do is you have to use Opera to create binary that you can run to age base, and then you write schema separately, whichever way you want to write it. Yeah. So the same way you can do it from above. Right. So the only thing you can do is to be able to read the past. You read the past. You also can just read the past. That's a picture of it. I did a project. Yeah. Yeah. Odagio doesn't exist yeah. anymore. What? Odagio doesn't exist anymore. So it's just we. Uh, they changed their name. Okay. Yeah. Here I thought it was one I but they do exactly that. They kind of extract the underlying H base, and you are writing records straight as a object image or a light string, and just writes it in, writes it, pulls it out very quickly. And it's a very, very effective way of handling large records, even because you're not moving into the fields. So you do take your, your record, we'll say some short record, pull out three fields that you use, get a fetch, grab it, and it works. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the nutshell, of the object is saying this, uh, you don't have to write this thing. You can just use uh, our remarks a lot to create your binary and you do whatever you want to. Okay, so there's intermediate. Yeah, the examples that I've given here are the simple everybody can use examples. There's a lot of classes in the class structure that they have in the package, so you can do a lot of different things, but it really is not well documented. Would you agree? To the level of documentation? It's horrible. Yeah. I always get the impression that I was a smart guy, but just like that. Well, yeah, I mean, he's. 
Doug started it, but uh, you know they've got quite a few people who are working on it actively. But yeah, the documentation sucks. Great code works phenomenally, but the documentation. Yeah. Uh, take a look at the code. <laughs> the code works. The code works really <laughs> well. I don't care what the code looks like. Right. So, so uh, thanks, Jim, very much. Like you said, we'll have this up on site. Hopefully,